Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our City Live. Uh, today, for our City Live, we are going to talk about a mission which we sell to our near-Earth asteroid. And for this conversation, I invite, invited to talk to me about this mission, Julie Castillo. Castillo. Hi, Julie. How are you? Hello. Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you, Frank, for the invite. Thank you. So Julie is the scientific PI of the mission called Neo Scout, which mm -hmm. is a very near <laughs> scout. Let's practice this one, Julie. How do you say it yourself? Uh, Nie Scout, and um, you know, after we chose the name, I think we we should have taken a Nie Scout, actually. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but anyway, we're gonna talk about that. The, the name does not really matter. What matters is truly the mission and the ambitious ambitious mission, in fact. So Nie Scout is a mission. It's a CubeSat mission developed by uh, NASA centers, and this mission will basically deploy a solar cell and sell visit an asteroid. Um, let's, um, let's maybe talk first about uh, the mission, if you want, Julie. I have some slides that you send me, if you want. You want me to share this? Yeah, you want, uh, I can. Or you can do it yourself, if, if you want. Uh, if it works, let's see. In the meantime, I remind our viewers that we're going to take some questions later on. So um, let's. Uh, Let's post them on the chat, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and uh, our team will send it to me. And I will basically uh, tailor this conversation based on your questions. So yeah, so Any Scout is a mission that was selected in 2013 by um, a department of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA. Uh, and it's developed in collaboration with the Marshall Space Flight Center and GPL as the main centers. And we have many other collaborators, of course. Mm -hmm. And so what happened at the time is that there, there was a call for deep space CubeSats uh, that could be deployed from the SLS during the Artemis 1 launch, which is a maiden launch of the space launch system. And that will happen this spring. And so various groups proposed to um, add CubeSat missions and uh, my colleague Les Johnson with the technology PI for the solar sail of any scout uh, and, and myself who proposed basically the same ID. And of course that made everybody enthusiastic. So any... So any scout is a 6U CubeSat. So you can think of one U is about the volume of one quart, one liter. And, uh, and so a 6U CubeSat, it's about the size of a sh uh, boot box. Mm -hmm. And uh, inside this box, we have all the subsystems that you would expect from a regular spacecraft. Uh, and on top of that, we have folded in a origami style, uh, this solar sail, uh, which is about um, 10 meters by 10 meters, so about 30 feet by 30 feet. And uh, it takes very little space when it's folded. It's the first use of a solar sail for a deep space mission for navigating to a target. It's not the first solar sail, solar sail missions because there have been several of these missions before, including the light sail mission uh, mm -hmm. run by the Planetary Society. But that's the first one that we are going to use for a science mission. So, um... Tell us a bit about this Artemis One mission, maybe, because most people are not really familiar with that. So what is this? So yeah, so Artemis One is um, going to be the first launch of the space launch system, which is the biggest rocket uh, that NASA uh, will build and probably the biggest rocket in the world. And so it's very exciting. Um, it's slated to launch uh, sometime this Spring, it's supposed to have a wet dress rehearsal in the next few weeks. So that's when uh, basically uh, the engineers behind the rocket do the an end to end test to make sure everything is working fine. And here you have a few pictures, uh, which I mean, I, I'm absolutely, you know, it's so impressive. This rocket is huge. And I'm, I apologize because I don't have the exact dimensions in mind, but it, it's just a very impressive uh, piece of engineering. Um, and so, there is one piece of the rocket that you can see 
here with what we call the Orion stage adapter, uh, which is uh, just below the top of the rocket. It has uh, about 10 CubeSats. I don't know if you can see them. These are the deployers that you can see them all around. Oh, wow. Yeah, they are very small compared to the size of the rocket. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so one of them is a NES scout. And, uh, and so what's going to happen is that when the uh, Artemis one launches, uh, it's good, the various pieces are going to be deployed and, and then uh, the CubeSats will be ejected one after the other, you know, like a PEZ uh, um, toy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they will be on their way to their destinations. Okay, so this mission is going then to, um, so this ejection will happen uh, while the rocket is on its way toward the moon, right? Yeah. The test flight is a, is a, it's a moon, uh, it's an orbit around the moon. Then there is deployment of the CubeSat. So what happened then, for, so, specifically for yours? Yeah, so the first week of the mission is going to be uh, particularly exciting because, um, I mean, the rocket, is, as you said, is aiming towards the moon. So... The CubeSats are also aiming towards the moon. And in our most recent simulations, I think we are flying by 150 kilometer altitude. And, uh, and so we need to perform a number of corrections to make sure that we don't crash, of course. Uh -huh. and so our uh, mission design team and navigation team, uh, they are uh, developing a number of trajectories uh, a number of trajectories and then inferring what kind of uh, corrections need to be applied. Um, and we have a bunch of constraints too, right? We can carry a lot of propellant uh, for these corrections. And so it, there is a lot of work involved there in order to optimize the trajectory. Yeah, so um, there's this kind of CubeSat they don't have, of course, the thruster that you have on large mission. They are, the propellant you're using for this one is a coal gas, I'm assuming? Yeah, it's a coal gas. Yeah. It's a coal gas. So you basically, it's like a spray. <laughs> You're basically going to have a spray and you have four, three or four different spray and you adjust them, such the orientation and the, and, um, and the spacecraft goes to the right direction, right? Exactly. So yeah, so I should specify that, I mean, our main propulsion system is the solar sail. Mm -hmm. And so we are pushed by, by the sun, but, uh, and, and you know, we can go very far. Uh, with a solar sail. But the problem is that it's extremely low thrust. So when we have to do trajectory maneuvers that require uh, like very fast reaction, like if you want to avoid the moon, you need to react fast. We don't use a solar sail. We need to have that uh, coal gas system. Yeah. So you're going, you're going to escape the moon orbit, basically. Yeah. And then deploy the light cell. So what is the size of this light cell to give us a scale of it, roughly? So it's it's oh, wow. about the size <laughs> it's about the size of a school bus, and so here you can see uh, so here's the school bus. Here you can see that when we're stored, when the any scout is stored, it's it's tiny, right? As I said, it's about shoebox size. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it's unfolded, it's about the size of a school bus. It's actually the bigger spacecraft <laughs> uh, sent to this deep space. Uh, when it's deployed. So yeah, it's a uh, it's very, very interesting uh, piece of technology. So this is gonna be encapsulated in the 6U as well. Yeah. And then deployed. Okay. And then what? So uh, yeah, so then, so we get to the asteroid uh, and uh, we don't know yet exactly what the cruise direction is going to be. And that's because we don't know our launch date yet. We, we are not even, sure that we are going to keep out our current target. It is possible that if the Artemis one launch slips a little bit further into the summer, we might have to change target. So what I'm telling you here is a, is a little bit notional. Okay. But um, so about a few weeks before uh, the flyby itself, the target is going to be uh, visible uh, in our camera. And we are flying a tiny camera. It's only one pound. Uh, and uh, it's about half a U, but it's extremely performant. And it was tailored to, uh, so that it can find uh, near Earth objects that have a large position uncertainty, which is the case of many of them, mm -hmm. and that are very dim. 
And so our target is only between five and 15 meters across. And so this camera can find it if it's about you know, 10,000 kilometers or 20,000 kilometers away. And so there will be a detection phase when we uh, look for the target. And then we are going to use what we call optical navigation, uh, which is that every day we're going to look where the target uh, is in our field of view. And based on that information, we are going to uh, slowly co correct the course of any scout so that we are slowly uh, approaching the target. The goal is to perform a flyby that is less than one kilometer distance from the surface. And so it's, um, it's, not, it's not risky. I mean, we, we understand very well how it's going to work out in terms of you know, the error in, in the navigation, but it requires maneuvering the solar sail every day. It's very intensive uh, form of uh, navigation. We can perform a very uh, close flyby because the solar sail allows us to go very slowly. It will be a flyby at about 10 to 20 meters per second. Oh, less than someone running, basically. Exactly. And so yeah, <laughs> we're going very, very slow. And every day we're going to do tiny corrections to the sail attitude mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the sun so that we hit uh, a close distance. Uh, it's going to be super exciting, for sure. All right. So before we dig a little bit more into the science, I would like to say hello to people who are joining us from Phoenix, Mexico, Riverside, uh, California, Brazil, Birmingham, UK, Canary Island, Cornwall, UK, Colombia, I don't know which, uh, Colombia, the country, uh, not the union, and British Columbia as well in Canada, Argentina, I would like to thank our viewers, those who had gave us some stars from Ron, from Pamela, and from Paula as well. Thank you very much. We are talking about the mission called Neo Scout, a, a mission that will sail to a near Earth asteroid. So let's assume there is no big change in the program. So the current target is 2020 GE, if I remember, mm -hmm. pretty nice name which is an asteroid that was discovered uh, two years ago. That's why it's called 2020. And uh, it's a relatively small in size, talking about something like 20 meters diameter, 60, 60 feet to talk in, uh, in the Imperial. So what, what do you expect to see? What is, what's the science? What's the, what's the goal, scientific goal here? Yeah, that's a great question because it's the tiniest uh, near Earth objects that will ever be visited. And so what we're going to learn is complementary to the other uh, missions that are currently exploring near Earth objects. And uh, there is the Osiris Rex mission, uh, the Hayabusa 2 mission, uh, there is DART, which is on its way to, um, to Didymos. And, um, and so our, our target is about one order of magnitude smaller than these previous any uh, the targets of the, these other new missions. Mm -hmm. So what we want to understand here uh, is first cut is information that can help inform a future crewed mission to a to a near Earth object. And uh, the mission uh, is sponsored by the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. And so the idea is to uh, get information that can help uh, understand how a crew would operate, would approach and operate and uh, you know, extract resources or bring a sample from this kind of small target. So we want to get the physical properties of the target, mm -hmm. uh, refine the size. Right now, I, we said about you know, 30 feet, and, but it, there is a big error bar. We want to understand the rotation properties and especially this class of objects, many of them have been found to be uh, tumblers. So they, they don't rotate like around a single axis, but they are all over the place, basically, in the way they rotate. Yeah. And that can be a big source of risk for uh, hu humans who want to explore the surface of the object. And then we want to understand the properties of the surface and if the surface is stable. And that, again, is very important if we want to work on the surface of this kind of object. And so we want to understand if you know very rocky surface or you know, very uh, smooth, if there is a lot of dust and things like that. All right. Um, can I ask you to stop sharing so we can just uh, see you now? 
Um, that's very inter interesting that we are going to be able to see in space a small asteroid. Because most asteroids we have seen so far are relatively big in size. Behind you on the background, I'm betting this is a picture, a map of uh, Ceres, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is a 1,000 ki kilometer diameter dwarf planet asteroid. So it's giant. Yeah. So we're going to be observing in space a very small 20 meter diameter asteroid. So really understanding, those are very numerous. I mean, there is millions of them in orbit around Earth. We know that. And those will be potentially the source of minerals or water in the future if we become a space-faring nation. So that's uh, saying civilization, sorry. So that's a, that's a very interesting scientific and technological, technological goal that you have for this mission. Um, I would like to remind people that we're going to take some questions. So let me let us know if you have any. I have a plenty of questions, in fact. But I'll, let's forget a bit about the science. But let's talk more about you uh, and your career. Um, so we know each other, okay, for quite a long time. But uh, how did you get involved in this? You mentioned the proposal, and what do you do concretely for this mission at the moment? Yeah, thanks for this question. Um, yeah, so I came to, so as everybody can figure out, I'm French and I did my, my studies in France, but I came to, Jeep, to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California 20 years ago this month. And, uh, and it's been very exciting. I came to work on the Cassini mission and since then I've been involved in, in, a, in a series of missions. And one of them was uh, as project scientist for the Dawn mission. And, and that's where we got the, this very cool picture of, uh, of Dwarf Planet Cirrus. Um, in the early 2010s, I was in, uh, working with a group uh, that wanted to pioneer the first deep space CubeSat. And so they were looking for science justifications basically for applying to, to these calls coming from NASA. And so that's how I became involved in uh, any scout. Um, that same group is behind the Mar Marco CubeSat, the Mars CubeSat 1 mission uh, that you know, was very successful a few years ago by relaying data from the InSight lander back to Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, on Marco, uh, what the Marco mission did for any scout is that they demonstrated a radio that we can use for deep space navigation with a CubeSat. And so, um, and so now when this scout is, is coming up with uh, another like nine uh, CubeSats that are going to be deployed and explored deep space, it, it's, it, we are entering a big new era, era of space exploration. Yeah, that's a very important that you mentioned. We mentioned that CubeSats are small, but they're not only small, they're also low cost, easier to launch. And of course, that's a, a way, a good platform to test uh, the technologies. Mm -hmm. and that's what you're going to do with this scout uh, NEA. There is a lot of technology that's been going to be tested. Uh, this camera, uh, this is a visible camera, right? I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 You're going to have a filter on it to do some colors, or what's the plan? So, so that, that's the thing. We, the, we had planned to put colors, but then we got very limited in terms of space and okay. so to drop the colors. And, you know, when we looked into that, it was six years ago. And at the time, we, the technology was not there to add colors. Now we have filters that can be uh, put directly on the detector and that can take no space and you know, are ready for deep space. And, uh, so there yeah. is hope for having color on the CubeSat in the future. All right, so we have people who join us from Myrtle Beach, Holland, Germany, in Europe. Hello, everybody. Uh, and I have a few questions coming. Um, so how the cell is being controlled? What exactly do you do? People think that it's kind of in, on a boat, okay? So yeah. concretely, what, what happened? What, how you control the cell and the director? Yeah. That's a great question and a great analogy because it's really about the same principle as a sailboat where we have uh, a system on the CubeSat, it's called the translation stage. Uh, that is pulling on uh, the various quadrants of the cell in order to control its attitude with respect to the sun. And so, uh, yeah, that's uh, the same idea. And that would be the first time that this kind of technology uh, is, is used in, in space. Yeah. So we have launched um, cells in orbit around Earth. And this is the first time this, we're going to be using a cell in an interplanetary mission. 
Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh, so, uh, from NASA, just to be clear, from NASA. the Japanese Space Agency uh, also launched the solar sail in the past. Which one was that? That was Icaros? Icaros, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. but yeah, exactly, and it was large, it was very large, it was using LED as a way to control the amount of light going to the sail and, uh, and so on. It was a spinning sail. Oh, yeah, I do remember the detail. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is simply simple because it's in the CubeSat. And, but the, the origami part of the deployment and so on. So how did you, how the engineer tested this? How did they test that he will deploy properly? Yeah, so they did test in, uh, not in, I mean, in some relevant environment, but especially mm -hmm. using gravity of loading. And I think there is a picture in the package where they show you, know, you have these alien balloons on each uh, cor corner of the sail. And so the, the deployer is basically turned on and very, very slowly uh, the sail is opening and um, helped by the balloon. There is a video online and I can share the link if people are interested. Okay. Excellent. Um, another question. So uh, the question about the target. Uh, Someone asked, is it worth looking at those small objects as opposed to large one? Uh, do we think that we have uh, more minerals, more water, or they will be strictly identical? So in short, if a piece of, can we say that the piece of 2020 GE will be exactly equivalent to the piece of a very large two kilometer asteroid, for instance? Yeah, I mean, in terms of in-situ resources, um... Yeah, I mean, you would expect that you find the same type of minerals or other objects of the, of the same class. Uh, in terms of the value itself, a few years ago, NASA was very interested in an asteroid uh, retrieval mission, and where the idea was to encapsulate an entire object of about the size of our target and bring it back, it back to Earth so that it's easier to mine close to Earth. So this kind of target definitely uh, carries a lot of uh, interest. Um, but something I forgot to mention earlier is also planetary defense, because this uh, size of objects is, is problematic. I mean, they are very numerous, as Frank said, and then um, they can create damage if they cross the atmosphere. So we want to understand their entire structure. All right. So that's the question. In fact, a good link to the next question. Someone is, ask, is asking, could we use this sailing technology to basically divert near Earth asteroids? So that's a cool question. I was watching Armageddon the other day. Uh -huh. And at the very beginning, the same idea is proposed that you use a solar sail to uh, put all around the comet and, and, and divert it. So in, in practice, the solar sail, unless you have really something extremely large, solar sail has very low thrust and can't mm -hmm. really counteract a very fast object coming toward her. Earth at you know, several kilometers per second. So I, I don't think that this would work in practice, but that's a very cool idea. Okay. Uh, we are reaching the end of the half hour. I have some questions. That, uh, one of them is about the, the day of the launch, mm -hmm. um, but we don't really know. Where will you be? Oh, I will definitely be <laughs> at the Kennedy Space Center. You will be there? Okay. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you invited already? That, did they send you the invitation? Yes. Okay, good. So that's because I went to see one launch uh, in October and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they planned this way in advance. That's cool. And um, yeah, people talk about the, the chance of success of a mission like that. Yeah, that, that's a, a very, very important question. Um, so we are doing what we call a class D mission, which means that because we have less money and you know it's a lot of new technology demonstration, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to do all the bells and whistles that you would have on a bigger mission. Mm -hmm. But we did have enough time, thanks to the delay of uh, the, the launch, we had a time to do a lot of checks on the spacecraft. And so at this point, we are pretty confident that you know, it's going to be successful. Um, we, our batteries were um, recharged uh, because, you know, we've been on the, at K, the CubeSat has been at KSC for a long time now, it's been yeah. more than six months, and so batteries have been recharged. So far, there are no major concerns. So you have a copy of NeoScout? Do you have another version that you can launch quickly on another mission? 
No, no, we, we didn't have funding to develop a copy. We have a, a very good uh, avionics test bed where we can, you know, if there are anomalies, we can do tests. But no, we don't have a copy. Okay. Okay, anything else you would like the, our uh, viewers to learn, to know about any, or any scout? So, yeah, I mean, stay tuned for the launch. And yeah, what it's going to, to be a fantastic uh, launch. And, and, and stay tuned for the mission updates. And hopefully, yeah, we survive. Really, this first week of avoiding the moon is a big deal. Mm -hmm. it should be, we should be okay. So we're going to have pictures or videos of the deployment of the CubeSat and of the opening of the origami uh, cell, do you think? Maybe, maybe not. That's a good question. I know there is one niche, one of the CubeSats is planning to take videos of uh, Artemis 1. OK. Uh, I don't know if they can catch any scout. We are going to call um, ground-based radars to uh, track the sail because it should be visible. Um, but yeah, otherwise we, we we could not pack. We did not did not have space for a small camera inside. Uh, inside, okay. Great. Well, I hope to see you uh, soon, Julie, on the launch pad or maybe at JPL or. Absolutely, you're always welcome. <laughs> 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 then I will come to see you soon. It's been a long time. Um, hopefully, now everything is coming back to normal. We're gonna be able to see each other more often. Yeah. So thank you very much for talking to us, giving us some uh, clue about this uh, great uh, mission. It's, um, it's, um, I look forward to see these cell op cells and this uh, first picture of a small asteroid in space. It's going to be very interesting. Congratulations for being involved in something like that, too. I think yeah, that's, exactly. uh, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. I thank you to all our viewers. Uh, so you know, we are the SET Institute, a nonprofit organization located in Mountain View, California. We, uh, we rely on, on you. Uh, if you like this video, uh, give us a thumb up, share it, comment it, ask questions. I'm sure Julie will love to get all your questions that we did not answer today. And, um, and yeah, and um, we also have a donation page. So you can go to seti.org slash donate and make a small donation, uh, $100, five bucks, I don't know, something to buy a coffee or tea or something to build a mission, a new, another Neo Scout, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, we're gonna give us an idea of the cost of this. Can you give us an idea of that? Um, it's not your new archive, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, It's. It, it's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive. Okay. But anyway, if you give us a million of dollars, we will be looking at to visit an, uh, um, an, an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Next, uh, this month in March, we have a SETI talk. Uh, we just decided this, in fact, today. And the SETI talk will be about mysterious radio signals in the galaxy. The title is tentative, of course. That's something I just wrote. But we are going to talk about those uh, weird signals that have been captured by uh, radio uh, arrays over the past five years. So stay tuned. We're going to make an announcement pretty soon. Thanks again, Julie. Thank you to all our viewers, wherever you are on this planet. And uh, see you uh, next week or in two weeks for another SETI life and another topic of, uh, of the beautiful uh, research we're doing at the SETI Institute and as